Hey guys, it's Adam from LucyPixel and welcome back. Now, last week, I started a conversation about motivation, about avoiding distractions, about how to find and uncover your most productive self as an artist. In it, I directed my attention a little bit more towards gamers. And in it, in this talk, I talk about how I learned to not only navigate around what could be one of the worst distractions out there and discuss and answer the questions on how we can actually use games to make us more productive, to inspire us and to jumpstart our creativity rather than hinder it. So if you find yourself in this particular demographic, I really recommend you check it out because there are answers. Now with that said, in today's talk, I want to broaden the scope and speak to us artists in general. Now, of course, we're all different. We all have our different passions. We all have our different hobbies. We all have our different tendencies. But even though we all have different tempos, different attention spans, different hobbies on the side, we are all fundamentally the same, aren't we? We all strive for greatness without any external factors or people pushing us towards it in most cases. We tend to be very independent. In fact, I feel artists in and of themselves are a bit of a loner race in a sense where we, we need our me time to be productive. We tend to scrutinize what we do quite deeply. We tend to really be hard on ourselves. We tend to be our own worst critics when it comes to our work. Even though there's nobody out there that might be doing that to us, we tend to do it to ourselves, which is quite interesting if you think about it. And as I start to describe these things to you, the first obstacle towards our motivation might be coming apparent. And that's the fact that we put a lot of emotional weight on what we produce. We tend to be very heavy on ourselves emotionally. The very act of producing is one that we take very seriously. And in that process, I find, and I have found in my past, we tend to put a great amount of pressure and consume a lot of energy just in getting to the point of getting started with a work of art. And therein lies our first problem. And therein lies what I feel has in many occasions held me back from taking those first steps. And I'm pretty sure it holds you back from yours too, doesn't it? Because the very prospect of just picking up that pen, just picking up that paintbrush, that pencil, and making those few first strokes is preparing yourself for, in many ways, an uphill battle, isn't it? I can't stress enough how much you need to realize that, to be emotionally and mentally aware of the fact that your thoughts are what are very often holding you back. A very athletic attitude about productivity is that famous Nike quote, just do it. There's a lot of truth to that. And the reason, there's a reason why that quote resonates far beyond running or CrossFit training. That quote is encouraging you, encouraging the athlete, encouraging the professional to take action before their thoughts talk them out of it. 
And we tend to do this with our own thoughts as artists. In fact, our thoughts, because our thoughts are at the forefront of what we create, we are creators. We use our minds for far more than just crunching data. We use our minds to fashion material things out of nothingness. That requires an abundance of focus and concentration. Your brain, don't take for granted, your brain consumes a huge amount of calories. I just happened to be watching, I was at the, at the hospital last week. Don't worry, I'm fine. I just hurt my back. But I was at the hospital and I had downloaded a few um, documentaries to watch while I was waiting in the, in the emergency room. And one of them is about the origin of humans. And one of the things they talk about, one of these important points in evolution of the human, of the human species was when we learned to cook our food. Learning to cook our food triggered a huge evolution and a very rapid growth in the human species. And the reason for this is because cooking your food greatly increases the calories of that food. And by increasing calories, it fed our brains. It was in cooking our foods that our brain had the calories to be able to grow faster than other species. And that is at the, that's at the crossroads of why humanity ended up growing intellectually far faster than any other species on this planet. Those calories fed our brains. Our brains consume a ton of these calories. If you spend all of that time worrying, thinking about doing something, considering whether or not you're making the right move, trying to strategize too much on whether you should do this or whether you do, should do that, you are in essence running a marathon every single time you think about art. When the marathon should be the active act of painting itself. So we need to learn something from Nike, from any institution, any body of thought that encourages you to invest that energy into the action, the physical activity of creating art. Now, is that to mean be physical and abandon the emotional? Absolutely not. Because as artists, we need to use all of these abilities, our emotional selves, our physical selves, our academic selves, our intellectual selves. We have to use all of these different facets of who we are to produce art. It's one of the only professions on this planet that require a combination of all of these things in balance. But by allowing the emotional and the intellectual to consume too much of you before you apply the physical act of painting, you are exhausting yourself before you've even gotten to the race. So instead, it, before thinking and pondering too much beyond what it is that you want to paint, pick up your pen, pick up your paintbrush and start to produce and it's in the act of creating marks on your page where you should start to allow your creative mind, your emotional mind, your intellectual mind to start to manipulate the direction you go with that art. And you'll find that the wave that you ride through your art, especially in those crucial early moments of artistic production, will be much smoother you'll have a great deal more inertia moving forward with your artwork. And that very often is one of the main keys to getting you moving forward with your artwork. Chris Oatley, and I've quoted him in the past before, he quoted in one of his Facebook posts, if you purchase 
a fitness magazine and read an entire fitness magazine every single day for an entire year, but you never go to the gym, will you get in better shape? Of course, the answer is no. When it comes to physical fitness, it's obvious. But it's not so obvious when it comes to art because we're also contending with our intellectual and emotional selves. So we tend to have a difficult time trying to know where to invest our time and energy, where we should be, how we should be splitting up our energies. And my very strong opinion and my solution that I'm proposing you today, to you today is to start with the physical. Have something physically sitting in front of you. And from there, you can start to manipulate that and refine it and apply perfectionism to it after. So that's my first big, big piece of advice to you. Don't think too much. Get up, grab a pen. That's your only job. Open up a Photoshop document, set up your canvas, whatever it takes, and start sketching, start painting. Your brain will turn on in the process. And because you're visual, you'll start to look at what you're creating. And you will start to manipulate that into what you want it to be without burning all that energy, just trying to figure out whether or not you should pick it up in the first place. Now, the next big obstacle between us and our most productive, most fulfilled selves, I find, is one that can sometimes feel a bit obvious and you can feel a little bit stupid for not coming to terms with this, but it's the whole technical side of things. It's the whole, I know what I want, but I have no idea how to get it feeling. But remember, you aren't just somebody crunching data. It's easy to get lost in the maelstrom of what to do, how to do it, when there are so many facets of yourself that you need to master. The emotional, the physical, the technical. The technical is a big one. But again, we have nobody necessarily sitting there by our side, holding us up while we do it. We have to go through every step on our own. We have to make every bit of advancement on our own. And it's very easy for us as artists to take for granted the great, huge journey we have ahead of ourselves. One way I could describe it is imagine you want to climb Mount Everest. You want to climb the the tallest mountain in the world. And that's what art is. It's the tallest mountain in the world. And you're standing in the parking lot at the base of the mountain. And you're looking up at the top of the mountain and you're thinking to yourself, it doesn't seem that far. I mean, it's a pretty big mountain, but it looks manageable. It doesn't look like a huge ordeal. So you pack your bags, you get your tent, you get your food, your compass, all your whatever, whatever mountain climbers need to make it to the top of the mountain. And you start your trek. And hours pass and days pass. And weeks pass, and months pass, and you are still climbing and climbing and climbing. Exhaustion, hunger, hypothermia, frostbite, death, heartbreak, all of these things, you encounter all of them on your way up the mountain. It's relentless, it's unforgiving, and it just keeps on going. And after all of that, after years of that, you take off your goggles and you look up and you realize you haven't even left the damn parking lot. And that's how it can feel sometimes. You can feel like you've spent everything you've got. You've invested years and years of your time and energy and thought and emotion. You've been through ups and downs. You feel completely spent and you realize 
you've just gotten started. And it's usually at times like that, that you put your pen down and you sit back and you put your hands on your face. And depending on who you are, you let out a big sigh, you get up and you walk out of the room and you make yourself a cup of coffee and you get frustrated and you throw your, you, you flip your table over, <laughs> you throw your book across the room. I've seen it all. As a teacher and as an artist, I've seen it and I've done most of those myself. I've found myself so incredibly frustrated on this journey towards growth. And it should. Because this matters to me. It matters to me a lot. This is the love of my life. My whole heart is wrapped up in my art. And I put everything I have into it. So when I feel vulnerable and when I feel weak and I feel tired because I've been just trekking forever, I, I realize I have, I've, I, I've only begun my journey. That thought can be completely and utterly overwhelming. And one of the things that can turn you off one of the things that can turn you away or make you question whether or not this is the career you should pursue. And sometimes it's not. It's something else to consider. But in the 99.9% .9 of the time that it is, let me share with you a little insight from somebody who's not at the beginning of their career and has seen his share of successes and failures. What I've learned professionally is success is not at the top of that mountain success is at the bottom of the mountain it's right there where you are right now this many decades into my career I'm looking at everything that I've experienced this endless history that is my artistic career behind me and that endless history that is to be made ahead of me. I'm at a place in my career right now where I feel like I'm getting confirmation that I'm going in the right path, that I'm doing the right thing, that I've succeeded to a certain degree. Not nearly as far as I want to go. I'm far, far, far from that. But I realize, looking at, ahead at my career, there is still no end in sight. Yet, I've got a lot of fulfillment. Happiness is not at the top of that mountain. Happiness is at the bottom of the mountain. Happiness is when you realize that what you do has meaning. It has purpose. That it's doing more than just feeding your ego, but it's feeding your life. My goal as an artist is not to be the most famous artist on this planet. I take far more, far much more pleasure celebrating the successes of others than my own. My students, my fellow peers, my artists. When I see Chris Oatley or Clint Kearley or Noah Bradley, or Tyler Edlin, or Anthony Jones, or any of these artists, when I see them do extremely well, I feel pride as a member of this community. And I'm not trying to paint myself as being some saint. I'm saying, if my only focus is my own glory, it's a very, very narrow scope. It's a very, very narrow vision. But to me, the greatest happiness, the greatest feeling of fulfillment that I've ever gotten in, in my career. And I've tried every different angle. I'm not just saying this because I'm saying, you know, be a martyr, be a saint, be pure. No, I'm saying it because I've tried the other venues and they were very shallow pleasures. When I can sit here, the success I feel in my career right now is in the fact that when I promote somebody, when I help somebody, that it makes a difference to them. Every single one of my students that I teach is a, is a success story to me. 
Every single artist that I collaborate with is a success story to me. Because my life has meaning beyond just making me look good. If you're standing at the bottom of that parking lot, if you're at the parking lot at the bottom of this huge mountain, and you're looking up at the top of the mountain, trying to locate all of the big hot shots, all of the elite, all of the stars, all of the best of the best, and you can't see them because you think they're too far away from you to see, because you think they're way out of your eyesight, you're looking in the wrong place. Those elites, those stars, those hot shots are in the parking lot with you. They're right there next to you. So you might look at your technical weakness, your lack of technical skill, but understand that in the big picture of this world of art and this community of art, and let's face it, the history of humanity in and of itself, we are newborns. I'm as much a newborn as you are. And even if I've been doing this for 20 years or even 30 years, and you've only been doing it for two, or maybe you've been doing it for six months, don't think for a second that I'm better than you. Don't think for a second that, that Frank Frazetta is somebody you're never going to be. Because in the big picture of things, in the big picture of art, this big, huge community we live in, this species we are a part of, we are all infants. And anybody who thinks that they're better or worse than anybody else because they've got a couple more decades of experience are very narrow-sighted. You aren't. And the difference between where you are right now and that amazingly impressive place you're going to find yourself one day is a very, very short trip. Trust me, the difference between being 18 and being 44, which I will be this November, is a blink. It's the snap of a finger and you're there. Life is very fleeting, as that expression goes. And you're going to find yourself sitting right here at this age, not feeling like an old, wise sage who's discovered the meaning of life and the magic recipe, you're going to realize that you are as much a kid at 43 as you are when you're 15 years old. In my heart, in my body, I'm still young. I'm still naive. I'm still as insecure, as unsure of myself when it comes to who I am as an individual. But I've learned to accept it. I've learned to come to terms with that. And I've learned to just embrace myself and all of my good and bad. I'm not trying to change myself or trying to present myself as being cooler or smarter or sexier or more talented than anybody else. I'm just, I'm just your friend. I'm just another guy. But my value comes from my ability to share. And my value comes from my ability to help others grow. And therein, to me, is the secret to killing two birds with one stone. It kills both the demotivation side of things, but it also feeds your technical growth. Because when you separate yourself from society... When you think to yourself, I'm like this and the industry is like that. General population is like this and I'm different. I don't fit in. I'm too introverted. I'm too weird. I'm too ugly. I'm too stupid. Whatever. Whatever excuse, whatever thought you have that alienates you from the rest of the society. It's in that separation, in the way you're separating, you're alienating yourself from the world around you, that you are denying yourself the greatest source of technical growth, and that is sharing with other people. Being a part of a community 
a good community, not a community of trolls and assholes, but a good-hearted, well-meaning community that are there to share their feedback. And I spent so many years of my life trying to succeed on my own, trying to gain that skill on my own. And my growth, my efficiency, my speed was about one twentieth of what it is now. I learned the value, the importance of surrounding myself with passionate, talented, well-meaning people. I only associate myself with kind people. I only associate myself with people that are out there for others too. My community, Lucid Pixel, my, my the community built around my mentorship. I've watched over the years how with little to no contribution of my own, minus just starting it, I've watched a community of some of the best, kindest, most helpful, talented people out there build this empire of helpfulness and community and camaraderie right in front of my nose. I didn't do anything to make that a success. They did. It was a collaboration. It was where like-minded, kind-hearted, well-meaning people got together in the same room and just watched the magic unfold. I don't have to manage it. I don't have to, I don't have to regulate it. I just sit back. I've never done anything. I've never had to ban anybody. I've never had to kick anybody out. <laughs> I've never had to, you know, to bump, you know, to, to muscle in on a conversation and mediate it. I just let it be itself. And the growth that they get from that is a beautiful thing to see. Nobody scrutinizes or judges anybody else for being more beginner. Everybody dotes and loves and, and admires and idolizes all of the more skilled artists. But nobody is resentful. Nobody walks away from that community feeling like losers. They walk away feeling like they're a part of it. Now, I'm a very cult sensitive person. <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know I, I've, I've watched enough David Koresh uh, uh, documentaries to be very, very against that kind of stuff. So I could very easily be painting a picture of, you know, our world is better than yours type of nonsense. No, it's just one of many great communities out there. And I love being a part of that. And there is where therein is where I find growth, just by being a passive observer of it. But find a place. Find people, a community, a school that, number one, doesn't exploit you financially. Number two, doesn't belittle you socially or alienate you. And most importantly, helps to fuel your self-confidence and helps to feed you with technical skill, either academically or emotionally or personally. Just healthy people with healthy minds that are there to watch you grow and revel in your successes rather than try to bring you down. Now, today's last topic with regards to motivation, the last thing I want to talk about today ties into um, a little bit into my social media video. And if you haven't seen it, it's one that gained a lot of traction, one that a lot of resonated with a lot of people, and that's how social media can, just, can ruin your art. I'm a father of three kids who have been raised in the world of social media. I'm somebody who lived many, many years, many decades prior to the birth and growth and explosion of social media. 
one of the things that I want you to be aware of, not change necessarily, but just be aware of, is how social media can affect your rhythm. How social media can can influence how you respond to day-to-day things. Now, I'm not going to go on repeating everything I said in my last talk. You can check that out for yourself. But I want you to be aware of how that affects you on an emotional level. I'll give you an example. My little boy, who I mentioned in last week's talk, loves video games. And I talked about how it has helped me to witness many of my son's skills with music, with game design, with hand-to-eye coordination, with memory, all of these things. There's a lot of wonderful things that are coming out of him, or at least things that I'm witnessing about him, qualities of his that I'm witnessing coming out as a result of his passion for video games. But there's a flip side to this. Remember, I mentioned last week, I'm a daddy, right? So his health is also something that I'm aware of, and one that you should be aware of yourself, of course, right? And I noticed how if I'd let him play games for longer than, let's say, a couple of hours, his energy level, his adrenaline would be very rattled. And I always find that following him playing games, it takes him a good 30 to 45 minutes for his brain to unwind, for him to come back down to a normal pace. And I found that particularly at his age and because of his personality that he's very drawn into video games, I have to, as a father, regulate and monitor how much he plays. Be aware of it. And in at times where he has gotten carried away or where if I've gotten carried away with my work, I've been sitting here drawing for a couple of hours and I didn't notice he's been sitting in front of the, his Nintendo for three hours or four hours or something like that. That I have to physically calm him down. I have to take him into, I, usually what I do is I take him into the bedroom and I close the doors and I close the curtains and I lay him down on a pillow and I'll talk to him very calmly and I'll rub his head. And at first he might be crying, I want to play video games, I want to play video games, I want to play video games, I want to play video games. And he's all wired, 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 wired. And the same thing it could apply to watching Netflix. It can apply to, you know, just watching YouTube videos of video games being played. It can be distracting himself in any which way. It's programming his brain to stay in a state of hyper constant hyperstimulation, relentless. And I see the same thing with adults too, my age. You can't do anything without having your cell phone with you, can you? And it's the same for everybody. And it's like that Star Trek episode. Well, since everybody else is doing it, I guess it's okay. And what I'm here to tell you is it actually isn't. And seeing a little five-year-old boy who's so wired that it takes him half an hour to come down is upsetting and it as a parent has caused me to have to be very strict about his how about his screen time to make sure that he pulls away from it now how does this how does this relate to you why am I addressing this to you the grown-up adult most likely or soon to be adult, artist, professional, or soon to be professional, or studying to be a professional? How does this apply to you? Well, my older daughter, Emily, spent many years of her life without cell phones. She spent many years of her life being bored. She didn't, she wasn't a big gamer, so she had to look for things to do. She learned how to play the guitar and play the ukulele. She learned how to sing. 
she would draw out lists of things constantly. Like I remember, you know, a mural with about 600 different types of tea when she was going through her tea phase or, or breeds of cats because she's completely obsessed with cats. She has grown up to be one of the most creative and produ- creatively productive people I've ever known. Far more than me. But I realized the most important ingredient in her creative growth was the most important skill and the most important pastime. Us humans, most particularly creative humans, need to take advantage of. And that's boredom. Boredom is a very powerful force. It's a very necessary important force you have to be forced into a state of boredom every now and then not always because too much of it it can be quite depressing and actually damaging that's why solitary confinement you know if you've ever watched Vsauce you'll know that anything beyond 72 hours of solitary confinement can cause permanent brain damage so that extreme is definitely not a healthy extreme But a little bit of healthy boredom every now and then forces your mind to turn on. And when you're constantly sitting in front of a screen, your iPhone, video games, YouTube, Netflix, anything you can get your hands on. And when it's so immediately accessible, what you're doing is programming your brain constantly, constantly to be in a state of stimulation. And when it's stimulated, It doesn't feel the need to go out and look for anything. You're basically feeding your brain constantly. And when you feed yourself constantly, you are never hungry. Right? So what you have to do is starve your brain every now and then. And it's going to be, I warn you, boring. (laughs) It's going to be boring. You're going to look around. You're going to look at your walls. You're going to look around at the wires under your desk. You're going to look at your curtains. You're going to look at the bleak looking outside with some old, very ugly, unpleasant looking person walking by wearing a very ugly, unpleasant looking coat and their ugly, scrawny little dog. And you're going to go, this sucks. And after about five, ten minutes of that, you're going to realize your brain's already starting to turn on. You're going to realize that social media and these distractions don't have nearly as much influence on you on the long term. And it's very easy to turn them off and turn on your creative mind. And when you turn on your creative mind, your mind starts to visualize. You start to tap into the part of your brain where art thrives. That's one of the reasons why Emily is such a freaking brilliant artist, why she's so incredibly productive. It's because she's learned the art of being bored and she's learned what to do with it. Lucas, not so much. So for him, when you pull it away, he goes through, he has a little bit of a meltdown. And I let him. I sit, I sit with him through the meltdown and I let him get through it. And I guarantee after he's had his cry, Eventually he realizes the video games aren't coming and his energy starts to drop and his shoulders drop and his tears dry up. And his the wavelength, the, the speed of his brain starts to level out and he starts to take comfort in the silence. And it's at that point that the brain becomes more lucid that your focus and those distractions start to just naturally go away on their own. One of the best things you can do as an artist when it comes to productivity is to slow your brain down. Just close your eyes. If you're sitting at your desk and going, oh, what am I gonna draw today? What am I gonna draw today? I gotta draw, I gotta draw, I gotta, fuck, I've been sitting here all goddamn week. Ah, I'm so, ah, come on, just do something. You haven't produced anything in two weeks. Just Stop. Close your eyes. Put your pen down. Take your drawing glove off. Let your shoulders drop. Just let your mind slow down. And I guarantee you, 
after a couple of minutes or five minutes or ten when you calm your brain down and you don't find you don't reach out for that for that stimulation you don't reach out for that phone that YouTube video that cigarette that anything anything to just distract yourself you start to find comfort in nothingness and your thoughts start to flood through in a much more non-stressful non-urgent way boredom ladies and gentlemen is an emotion that we need to master because artists unlike any other profession on this planet artists thrive in boredom and that's another reason why social media can damage that creative ability because it prevents you from being bored 24 hours a day seven days a week all right so once again thank you for sticking it out this long you guys truly are amazing and i cannot state enough how much i reflect that love and that appreciation back at you because i'm here producing these videos for you because you're so awesome so you deserve some of that awesomeness back all right so with that said happy painting and take care Thank you.